So uh, next up, we have a couple of uh, different presentations that will be uh, walked through back to back. Uh, the first is on the power of insights from AI and data science projects. And the second is on data science best practices. Uh, and we'll have time at the end for Q&A. So if you do have questions watching the two presentations, uh, please put those into the Q&A panel and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. Um, so I'll now introduce our speakers for both of the presentations. Uh, uh, first is Wouter Oosterbach, uh, who's Chief Data Scientist uh, Europe for IBM Advanced Analytics Center of Competence. Wouter is a neuroscientist by trade and a data geek at heart, uh, and an experienced cross-industry data science consultant who has seen companies through the phases from unplanned data landscape through to actionable results delivery. Uh, and Vouter will be joined by Beth Rudin, who's a data science and analytics executive with IBM. Uh, Beth is a global executive leader with 20 plus years of IT and data science experience at IBM. So uh, over to you, Vouter and Beth. Thank you so much. Um, we are very happy to be here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up my screen to share. And I want to just do a quick check to make sure that everybody is able to see the screen. Router. Awesome. Yeah, that's looking good. We're seeing the screen. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So I am in in part of the the position that I'm that I'm holding currently, and I am an IBM Distinguished Engineer and Principal Data Scientist. So I have gone through this certification and really got to be, you know, one of the one of the very first people to take and and make sure that this certification is a, a really good cloud path for all of our IBMers because one of the things that I believe in very strongly is given, you know, given the the ability to take your own goals in your hand and and you know I have people all over the world who ask me every day am I allowed to go get certified as, as a data scientist? And it's interesting because I think that, you know, that, that type of perspective is something that um, we don't often get. But when um, I got to work with George Stark and Dean Riley and Marie Norton on creating the data science profession within IBM and really rolling it out and making sure that it is, it is something that is sticky um, I also, you know, the, the data scientist in me, I was super curious and I wanted to see what are all these amazing projects that people are submitting. And, you know, of course, um, we use some data analysis to do this and we put together this, this package and it's, it's one of the things that it's a setup because it's a setup for all of the various hypotheses of really starting to understand this new data science profession. And um, I think it was 2012 when the Harvard Business Review said that the data scientist would be the sexiest job of the 21st century. And, you know, that's when we really started thinking about, you know, how, how can we create data scientists that have the type of training? And that's why we're so excited to present this um, Academy of Technology study, as well as our data science method, in order to show you the open group, our accreditation you know, system to show what we can do with the data. And so this, um, and just to make sure that everybody knows, the Academy of Technology is IBM's um, Academy. And it has been around for well over 50 years and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely evolving, but 1 of the things that we get to do is, and is we get to work with people across business units. And we are 250,000 humans in a different in, in 175 different countries and we have such a wide diversity of culture and thought that we we have these academy initiatives that we create and i sit as the vice president on the technology council for ai ethics and data science and our academy is really about gathering people together and doing projects like this that that aren't necessarily revenue generating or um, client facing 
But um, this is something that we do because we want to be able to test hypotheses. And the best way to do that is to gather people from all kinds of disciplines across different, um, across brands, across business units, and allow them to look at data or do experiments in order to really showcase what we can do. So our academy does many of these different initiatives and we produce um, you know, a lot of different reports across the board. And this is something that I think is a little bit different because we actually used our own data set. So with that set up, um, these are insights from 900 different projects by IBMers. Um, we, we have, uh, obviously we have all of our data scientists submit their project profiles for the certification. And this is a treasure trove of information because I can start seeing some of the various shapes takes, you know, take space and come to form on who is a data scientist and, and what, what kind of work are they doing? Who are the people that they're interacting with? understanding what kind of algorithms that they're using, understanding what kind of business problems that they are solving. And, you know, all of the data was anonymized, so we didn't know who was who. Um, we do have, you know, lots of different um, specific, more uh, mathematical things that, of course, we didn't anonymize that, that I think are just absolutely fascinating. So we had 28 different IBMers um, from 10, 10 different countries contributing all of this shared knowledge. Um, we, we also use this to connect to all of the master data that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more because I think that um, most of the data scientists that I talk to, uh, the, the thing that I hear the most is, you know, obviously the data preparation is 50 or 80% of, of the problem. And if you think about, you know, just roughly every single data scientist creating a notebook, and if they have the master data to connect to, this, this accelerates their ability to be able to use the master data that is already well-formed as opposed to um, well-formed and governed as opposed to redoing that normalization and standardization to get to your master data dimensionality that you would use within some of your data science projects. We have stories on client industries, business units, data science algorithms and tools. I mean, in, and this is just the beginning. Like I said, this is a setup and um, we're, we're really taking this to a, you know, a, a different place and modeling and meta modeling how we can work in multidisciplinary teams in order to be able to tell the stories and put the soul underneath what data is because data is a story, but it needs the soul of the people to really tell that story. Um, and then we have a recommendation on um, augmenting and enriching with our data connection, and we've already initiated phase two. So when we first started looking at, at the shape of the data, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at, you know, a, a good variance from each of the different badges. So we really focused on uh, level one and level two badging. We did augment with some of the level three and both router and I are level three certified. Um, the application obviously includes all of the free text, um, but then we were able to link it with most of the metadata that we have within the employees. So what role they play, like what is their job role skill set within the HR system? What industry did they, you know, connect to? What, you know, what was the date? You know, obviously the, um, your, your time dimension on when they put through. We, we really, um, obviously, the data prep and preparation and engineering is, is the hardest part of getting, you know, the data into some of the well-formed well ordered data sets that we need in order to be able to perform calculations. And this is where we started connecting to metadata, and I'm going to talk a little bit about ontologies later on. But, you know, this is where we really were able to abstract a lot of the um, structure from the unstructured text using um, NER and LDA and some of the things that we can use from a text analytics perspective to be able to put this together and, and see some of these stories. But um, if you see the global reach of this and in, in, of, of our projects and our corporation, this is something I am hugely proud of because I think that through the last two years in the pandemic, my friend Router, who is sitting in Munich, um, you know, it just offers me such a different perspective on a personal level. So having a global company and being able to connect to people all around the world 
especially as you know we're we're locked inside and and um, hopefully being careful and taking you know taking advantage of of understanding different perspectives from what is happening in different countries this is something that that i have a huge amount of pride for that that ibm is able to showcase this level of cultural diversity so um and and just a side note what one of the biggest reasons that we chose l1 and l2 is that they had you know very explicit questions and l3 obviously has some different questions which i think that you guys know but we wanted to have like that control of having the l1 and l2 so in the middle of this project, I had connected um, uh, with my my friends within the global chief data office and prior to taking the role that I have now, I was the chief data officer for our company, formerly known as GTS. It's now known as Kindrel. And um, one of the things that that I believe in so strongly is this construct of, you know, creating a data fabric or um, a data mesh or something that you can really start to centralize and govern your master data and then allow access to that master data through APIs. I think that it really trains your data scientists to start interacting with cloud services as well as DevOps systems and be able to access things, simple things like industry as an API instead of rebuilding the entire dimension of industry. So um, we were able to accelerate this quite quickly because when I found out that the data scientists, the, the people who were doing this particular project were struggling with the, you know, the simple normalization and standardization in order to get the industry aspect out, I was like, hey, did you know that our global chief data office has 55 different APIs for access to master data? And it, it eliminated a huge amount of work. It eliminated, you know, the 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 understanding that they would have to start to do some of this. And it's just it's a simple thing, but I mention it because even within a corporation of, like IBM, we didn't we didn't have everybody have knowledge that they can access these APIs so that they can simply understand how to map the project badge to the industry. And, and that was that was something that I think is is a very, very good lesson is that especially we as executives, we need to communicate better to all of our people who are doing this work so that they understand what's out there as opposed to trying to recreate it. The business units and industries. So this is um, in and this is where I'm exposing a little bit about IBM, but I think it's so significant because we are one of the the only product and services companies that have this type of distribution of all of our different project profiles across business unit and across industry. And when we first took a look at this, and this is probably one of my favorite charts, I started to say the people who are doing, you know, things in the automotive industry and GDS, which is now known as our IBM consulting organization, you know, we had, you know, five in cloud and cognitive, which is our product division, and then 26 in our consulting division. And I have started in, I'm the anthropologist by training, so I'm the social scientist. So I'm always sitting here going, what does a data scientist look like and how do, what do they wear? What do they do? What do they eat? You know, what, what do they sing? Um, and I, I started to, to formulate some hypotheses about, you know, people who were working in our product division as data scientists versus people who were working in our consulting division as data scientists, who are people who were working in our managed services division as data scientists, our research, our global markets. And we started to be able to see the flavor differences on how they started to think about the problem, um, you know, really understand what our client's issue was and formulate that into a hypothetical statement that we could test. We, we needed to start to look at the data in detail and again, start to extrapolate these stories so that we can shape and, and start to understand all of the various flavors of the data scientists, not from their resumes or the things that, that you know, they have self-reported, but more from their project profiles and how they have helped serve our clients and customers with their data science tools and techniques. So I just, I found this really fascinating as well as really proud again to see this, this level of variance across IBM of the people who 
submitted their project profiles to talk about what did they do in the different industries and then the, the width and the breadth of the industries that we were able to create. This is another, um, you know, sand key diagram and this, this I thought was very interesting because, um, like all. Companies and corporations, like all human beings, we, we, we kind of wear our tribes and we wear our team and we say, well, I come from research. So, you know, this person in services, you know, I don't, I don't think that they, they truly, you know, passed the, the data science problem or that I don't think that they really got it. And, you know, I use that as a negative example only because I, I want to, I want to talk about this where when we have different data scientists that are using data in the scientific method to truly solve a client's business problem, we have to make sure that we're speaking the same language and we have to have that common repertoire in order to make sure that people understand that a services engagement will be very different than a research engagement where the goal in services is, is to deliver for a client where the goal in research might be to publish a patent. And so we had to deal with these various flavors in a way that we could start to make sure that we, we engendered the respect from one division to another, from one um, industry to another, and using this sort of sand key diagram to look at who started it, you know, who, who passed, who, who failed, where did it come from, from the different countries, which business unit did it flow through, um, where did it go to within the industry? I, I just, I found this a, an excellent way to study the behavior of our data scientists and our human beings, both the ones that were submitting the projects, as well as the ones that were, you know, truly looking at the projects in a way of, okay, I am going to pass this person or I'm going to fail this person and seeing if we could start to tease out some of the biases that we wear and that we, that, that we are part of because we are part of the system or that is part of our team and our team culture and how we behave. Stories on data science tooling. Now, this is where um, I, I I really think it's very interesting. Um, but you know, the the thing that that just jumped out at me is that our our IBM services or our IBM consulting organizations really used far more open source than um, any of our product division. Shocking. Um, and the data science applications from global markets and our cloud and cognitive, our product divisions, obviously reported Watson and SPSS more frequently. Um, and I, I think that it's just, it's interesting to note that you started to see this, this flavor of open source be, be more apt to the services, because I do think that we're seeing a shift in the building of the AI software to the front line of delivery where we are looking at the more open source um, applications of how we can use those types of applications as opposed to some of the products that may or may not give us the facility of things like you know Python in order to be able to do that. However, I will tell you that I would love to do a time series analysis to see if there is a lot of, um, because you're, you're doing that trade off because when you use open source, it's less maintainable in the future and you always have to update it. So if you looked at it from like a time series analysis, if you look at something that went into production as open source, what did that application do over time versus an application that was fully supported from our product division, for instance? These are the types of kind of questions and um, hypotheses that I literally think of every single time I look at some of this data in this analysis. Um, the detail investigations um, that we're doing now is we're using ontologies and a knowledge graph in order to be able to look at all of the language variation and the ontological hierarchies that we are starting to create in order to be able to do some inference and reasoning. So the stories on the data science algorithms. Now this I thought was even more interesting because we have um, a, a wider range of algorithms within the, in the services division. And again, we're going to um, tie this out in some of the hierarchies and build out an ontological 
knowledge graphs so that we can actually start to look at some of the unstructured text and the ontology that we're building out is based on all of these project profiles and starting to see the um, the the skew that is happening and you know there's definitely um, some something that I'm starting to see is that when you're looking at the use of different algorithms, some data scientists obviously have a preference over other data scientists, especially when you're 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 trying to do some of the models and the the model connections here. So we're gonna we're gonna see what we can we can actually infer from some of this work. Um, again, I I just think that this is a phenomenal way to look at um, the fact that bank and finance obviously loves your tree based models. And I think that's fascinating um, where we, we had this, again, skew that you can see that, you know, the in the banking and finance industry, again, looking at it as your X and Y axis of, of what model and algorithm you're using against the industry and where where your clusters are. Um, so regression and classification and exponential family linear models within your banking and finance, as opposed to some of your other industries. And I just think it's it's fascinating to start to develop your hypotheses. Look at the health one, which is obviously, you know, more skewed to to your tree based models, but has a little bit more um, variance when you're looking at regression and classification. So. Again, we're um, phase two, uh, understanding what we can do and see if we can come to, you know, either conclusions by industry or my hypothesis is it's based probably more on your network of people and how you were trained. So, um, uh, again, just a, a little bit of an ode to knowledge graphs to understand both the ontologies and the entities that we are extracting out as well as their relationships to one another. And, you know, this is some of the, um, the more hierarchies that we are working with, like a mode seeking algorithm is a mean shift clustering is a clustering model is an unsupervised model. And understanding how to build out these hierarchies in a dynamic way using the unstructured text so that we can, you know, detect the hierarchy and then put it into more of the formal knowledge graph so that we can use the knowledge graph in order to feed some of the text analytics in order to feed the ontology to be able to get back to this taxonomy. So um, this currently we're using um, a named entity recognition in order to be able to detect, you know, some of the um, some of the algorithms within the unstructured text. So to just give you an example of how we're doing this and then using um, a human neocortex in order to create the hierarchy, but also to uh, place that into a, a knowledge graph that can be used across the organizations and be able to be expressed as an API with code architecture. So here's where I want to pause for a bit, and I wanted to ask um, Router to talk a little bit about, you know, when he went through the data science certification, as an L3, he went through, um, you know, a, a combined path in order to really look at L2 versus versus L3, and this is um, this is a slide that really starts to showcase, you know, how we are looking at the the um, the level of performance across the different uh, the different um, packages that we see and the project profiles that we see. But I wanted to give Router a little bit of airtime to just talk about his experience here, because I think that is it is seminal in thinking about how we are actually, you know, able to solve our business problems and connect to our client issues and understand that and the different type of variety that we're starting to see um, between L2 and L3 because of the ability for us to start seeing the similarities between all of the L2s together and doing some clustering and cosine similarities there. Yeah, absolutely, and thanks, Beth. And, and you know, to, to, to almost take that, that first part of the question, like, what was my experience like? And so one of the things that, I, I mean, you, you all may know that this is a fairly structured 
uh, process in a sense to, to go through as in we have we have different um, sections uh, of the of the, the process sec different aspects of the whole data science workflow in, in essence and and what we do is of course we look at you know how do you how do you see this particular se section what did you do you know for example to understand your business users what did you do uh, later on in deployment etc so so one of the things is that it it makes you, to have that overview now makes you look at at some of the newer projects and go okay well do I have the same type of of breath now in in a project do I have the same kind type of QA as as I did for the projects that you know that helped get me to this level because sometimes and and this this was I think one of my other big experiences you tend to think differently about some of these projects afterwards versus you know the the pressure you sometimes get in data science projects to to, to get the immediate value to deal with things that are you know perhaps an inflated perception or an inflated expectation as to what the tooling can do versus what the reality of what the data it looks like sometimes is so so you know, and and to to go then through to have to really have to write that down in these different steps, and also to talk about things like stakeholder management and impact. You know that it 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 makes you look back and go, well, you know what? Uh, in these and these and these cases, I was able to take you know also the long term view with with regards to you know impact and stability of the system to 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 link back to what Seth was saying the impact on the users uh, for example and and you know really take that take that and balance that all out versus i built a model that was as good as it could be which which is which is a very different uh, which, which is a very different um uh goal and metric to to uh, to try and optimize, and it um, it got to the point where so uh, I was telling this to Beth before that I happened to be coaching an L three candidate last week, and and this L three candidate was looking at hey you know these are some of the questions I have for L three, but he said I I I'm not sure I get all of this because some of this seems very you know business strategy focused. Some of this is very consulting focus, almost in a sense, and and the the conversation I had with him was well, well to me, some of that is the essence of of an L three because of, of of thought leadership that that you're going to look to apply because what we're not necessarily looking for is you can grab data and you can apply a model and report an outcome, but but you can understand you know how. The, the business and how you know people that input numbers into a database and how they do that and why they do that how that affects the rest of the system you should be building how that affects you know what you should do with missing values what you should do with normalization what you should do with model selection and strategy and how you should design you know human in the loop systems and to me you know, thought leaders there can can express what that interaction is like and why they make choices. To me, thought leaders there were looking for people that motivate their actions almost in a, when building when building a, a human centered AI system. And you know, that, those those were some of the things where where I think the 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 structure we have with with the open group certification helps, let's say, fill in and round out this this picture of um, you know building human centered AI systems. Thank you so much, Ratter. I wanted to pause and um, ask if there are any questions um, because we're going to go into our next session. But if there are any questions that anybody would like to ask at this time, I think that this would be a great time to do so. So I, I see one in the Q&A, um, Beth, and I'll, I'll let me just read it to you and, and either one of you can pick it up. How do you ensure Privacy, ethical, and security guards are in place when providing access to master data across industries. So, one of the um, 
lovely things that we have within IBM. And it's something that um, both Router and I actually provide services and consulting for is to be able to create a centralized um, chief data office that governs and manages the master data and then provides a thin consumption layer across the entire organization that is fully secured and has traceability and auditability for who is accessing what type of data when. And we provide that in these 55 different APIs that we have to date, but they are growing and growing and growing. So um, this is something that we have within IBM that we are always trying to replicate and help our clients get to. And it's very difficult to do over an enterprise organization at that level, but the concept is very simple is you centralize and you govern the information that you need to replicate and get out to the rest of the organization. And then you allow that consumption layer to be to be open so that all of your developers can use the correct API accessibility that have the tied in auditability and security that you need in order to make sure that you have the, the access that you are required to have. Not a simple answer, but I, I will tell you that it is incredibly effective once you have the correct investment to be able to push this out into an organization. It allows people to have a common language and I cannot emphasize how great of a impact that can have across your organization. Okay. Um, so I, I have one uh, myself after looking at your data about the projects and the industries they came from. Uh, it occurred to me that uh, in oil and gas, so we have a forum in the open group called the OSDU forum that was really founded to, um, to solve their data access problems and to enable a move to the cloud. Uh, things were very fragmented in that industry and uh, prior to the advent of the OSDU data platform. Um, so I wondered uh, in other industry, and, and so that fragmentation, I would think would be a barrier to really doing effective data science work for those kinds of companies. Um, and I just wondered among other industries, if you see structural barriers like that, that exist and just sort of what the experience is with those. What I have found is that the domain expertise is far more important sometimes and the knowledge and the language in order to be able to resolve those types of fragmentation is a larger feature of being able to be a successful data scientist within an industry. <laughs> and so um, I th that is my opinion um, because I have seen so many data scientists struggle, um, healthcare is one, where you know the 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 acronyms and the language and the understanding of that domain is is far more critical to the success of being able to solve the business problem than dual PhDs in linear algebra. <laughs> uh, um, Rather, do you have do you have a, a a comment there on domain expertise and fragmentation of data? So, so uh, I agree with you on the domain expertise uh, versus the, the the dual PhD. I I wanted to to touch upon the the, the fragmentation bit, um, and we'll we'll touch upon this briefly in 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 the next section as well. But you know what? Uh, this is also something that that companies that have tried building data science capabilities have have kind of gone back and forth on. Uh, because because what we've seen, I think, four or five years ago, and and this is when you know a lot of the the, the, the data science within industry was we'll build our first teams and we'll do the, our first let's say attempts with data science and AI. People did indeed say, well, it is tricky to get all of this data together. Um, so so we are going to go to a lake setup. We're going to put everything together. A data scientists is going to plug right in there, and uh, you know and and then they're going to build models and, and that's going to be the easiest section. What what that has ignored uh, almost, I mean, and this is this is my hypothesis, is that within larger enterprises, there is nothing to properly incentivize that kind of behavior to and to keep that to keep that going. Uh, when when you centralize your data and you clean it all up, 
that is nicely centralized and cleaned up for about a week. And, and, and then the, and then things change again. So what we are now actually seeing is companies, you know, starting to ask about, okay, how can I distribute data? How can I have fragmentation by design? have and have that sit within the domain with the experts mm -hmm. okay. while still ma maintaining like a modicum of control while 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 making that a, an efficient setup because then you you uh, you know you acknowledge the fact that companies are made out of, uh, made up out of humans that you know tend to do things that are in their own interests and you know i i think try, having tried to to centralize everything that would that was kind of you know, in some cases that worked, but in a lot of cases that that caused some some type of conflict in that way. So what we're actually now seeing is more fragmentation, or rather federation by design, and companies asking what is what is the the level of federation that works for me, that works for my setup, that works for the people I have. It, well stated, and I. Um... I see another chat, a question in the chat in the QA. Um, m my role is mainly client facing. I, I do I do have uh, we we actually have some some things that are going out r more recently on AI ethics, and if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I can I can steer you to that because part of part of what we're going to go through next is um, the the data science method. And I think that this would be a good lead in unless there are further questions that you guys would like to ask us. Yeah, it looks like that's it for the questions at this point. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to go into your second presentation.